So we are thrilled now to announce the keynote speakers for the 2023 NF Summit, Derek Helton and Conrad Cordova, two adults living with NF. Der oh, you're there. Derek is an extraordinary individual. He's a former USA wheelchair rugby player, a Paralympic medalist. Suddenly, at 18 years of age, Derek experienced a series of medical complications and landed on the diagnosis of NF2. Since then, Derek has poured his passion and determination into sports. He has had a 10-year international athletic career earning gold and bronze Paralympic medals. And I think he brought a medal with him today for you to see. In 2022, he was inducted into the USA Wheelchair Rugby Hall of Fame. Currently, Derek is retired from sports and is currently a stay-at-home dad to his three children. I'm jealous of you. <laughs> Derek and Conrad are also Arizona residents. Here they are, friends and NF fighters. Each has used NF for additional accomplishments. Derek and Conrad met in Arizona many years ago. And here they are. Thank you. Drop my mic. Thank you for that warm welcome. I'm very excited to be here. Is there, you guys have the clicker to advance slides? Sorry. Thank you, Heather. Um, thanks again for that warm welcome. Thank all of you for coming from all over the country to sunny Arizona. Can you imagine living in the Midwest and shoveling snow in 100 degree weather? That would be a little tough, right? So. Um, but welcome, and, and Derek and I are very privileged to be up here to speak to you. Our aim, our goal for you, hear our story. I bet it's not very different from what many of you have experienced in your lives. Derek and I hope to inspire you if you face challenges, physical challenges, cognitive challenges, learning challenge, challenges. We hope to inspire you to at least try and, and fight those, those uh, obstacles, those barriers. Um, we're nervous, so bear with me. But I'm very privileged to, to be up here with Derek. I was very pleased when we were asked to speak. We are to entitle our, our talk, Neuroverbomatosis, that's why we're all here, right? Uh, no fear, no failure. And we'll define what that, what that means here. So Derek, we had a, multiple fundraisers back in Tucson, Arizona, uh, racing for research, etc. And in 2012, Derek came to one of our fundraisers. That's where I met he and his wife, Krista, uh, who's here also with their children. Photo on the left is my 12-year-old son. Uh, he was probably two years old then, um, pretty close. And uh, the photo on the right was the last summit or forum in 2015, right? 2015. And that's where we, we met here, but we kept in touch during our you know, during our living in Tucson, and thank God for social media because it's a lot easier. Um, anything you'd like to say? No, I, I agree. Social media is a big bridge. I mean, especially with my hearing and conversation-wise, social media is really a place to connect on so many different levels, especially within F community. Right, and Derek is deaf, so he can see the captions. So, so um, I'm going to try and speak slowly. Uh, but he can speak, uh, but he'll talk about his, his uh, life and losing his hearing. Um, so growing up, I, my story, I grew up um, in Tucson. I didn't have a great foundation in high school. Um, I worked most of my high school part-time, uh, and I didn't do great, but I had big dreams. I wanted to go to medical school. That's what I wanted. I wanted to be a physician. I got slammed into the medical world and healthcare just by, you know, by life. You know, my father died when I was 10 from lung cancer. And I remember going to the hospital many times with him when he was dying. 
and all I saw was doctors and nurses, et cetera, and I was intrigued. And then in high school, I worked in housekeeping at a hospital, and I saw some amazing things, and I was so inspired by these professionals. Like, I want to be like them. So I had dreams of going to school, becoming a medical, becoming a physician, a minute, an MD, and helping people in that manner. That was my dream. So after high school, I went to college, and I struggled. I didn't have a good foundation. I could not, uh, I, could, I felt like I couldn't learn. Now at this time, I have to say something. I didn't know I had NF. I have NF1. I didn't know at that time that I had NF1. And I struggled, and I thought, well, you know, Spanish was my first language. My parents are immigrants from Mexico. Um, maybe, you know, that's why I'm struggling. I just didn't have a good foundation. And I took classes and I failed, and I took classes and I failed, and I took more classes and I failed. And repeatedly, instructors would come to me and say, hey, Conrad, you know, you have until Friday to drop this class, because if you don't drop this class, it's going to be on your transcript. You don't want to be on your transcript. So I dropped out. And I went back and I failed and I dropped out. I took tons of classes. Um, the only class I got an A in was when I took an EMT class, and then I started working as an EMT. When I was 18 years old, I was running around the streets of Tucson on an ambulance. My 20-year-old son's doing that now, today. Um, so, um, yeah, thank you. I'm very proud of him. So, I just kept failing and I quit. I said, you know, I went, when you take a class for the third time and the previous two, two times were failures, you're obligated, you're, by policy, you have to see the counselor, the academic counselor. So I went to the counselor and she says to me, you know, maybe you should think about learning a trade. Maybe becoming a, a medical, a doctor or a nurse is not in your future. Clearly evidenced by your transcript, you're not succeeding academically. You should think about another career. And I was crushed. I felt, um, I think many of you can relate to this. I felt uh, very, I was embarrassed. I have my notes here, sorry. Keywords. I apologize. So, defeated, that's the word I was trying to get out. I felt defeated. And the counselor's words to me, maybe you weren't meant to be in higher academics. You should really think about learning a trade. Trades are greatly underrated. You can learn a lot of money, a good living by learning a trade. So, I felt like a failure, because I had these dreams. So I started working on an ambulance, and I did that for several years and did a, part, did a, uh, a few years with a, a little fire department. And then I left that role and went to work in a hospital. I had an opportunity to start working in a hospital with an emergency heart team. And the nurses I worked with, I was inspired. I was like, I could do this. I don't know why, um, why I failed, but I'm smarter than them. I could do this, because I worked with some great people. But I noticed things that I thought, eh, I'm not a nurse, but I have better judgment than this. So I decided to go back, and I was terrified. In my mid to late 20s, I went back to nursing school. And I well, went back to school, rather. And I started taking the same classes I failed before. And I had to see an academic counselor, because I had taken chemistry three times and failed three times, uh, microbiology, and failed. So I went back. And I told her, well, I think I'm more mature now. I think I'm ready to try. She said, okay, do it. So I got an A in my first time, my first science. Didn't think much about it. And I went back again. And I got another A, and then another A, and then another A. Then I realized this was not, um, sorry, my mouth is very dry. Then I realized this isn't um, an accident. I think I'm learning to learn. I think I've learned how to learn because before I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. I just didn't have the skills. And I think I was in my mid to late 20s. I think now I think I might have the skills. Then I didn't have any self-doubt. I got accepted into the, into the junior college. It's a great college of nursing on my first attempt, which is a very competitive program with hundreds and hundreds of applicants. I got in on my first try. I've graduated from nursing school um, in 96 with an associate's degree with a GPA of 3.7. If you take away all the other grades, just the applicable grades. So I had a great career as a critical care nurse and a flight nurse and an ear nurse for several years. And then in 2005, I went back for my bachelor's degree because the hospital said, hey, we'll pay for it if you go back to school. I'm like, I'm there. I graduated with my bachelor's degree with a 4.0. It, 
it was challenging, but it was not hard. And I didn't feel, I didn't feel um, it was difficult the way it was when I first started. I found it easy to start thinking, well, maybe I am smart enough, you know? I needed to learn how to learn. So I remember when I first, when I went back to the community college, I was absolutely terrified every class, going to every class. Am I going to fail? Am I going to fail? When I went for my bachelor's degree, it, I had no, no fear whatsoever. And then many years later, um, a lot of my friends were going back to grad school to go to nurse practitioner programs, which has just exploded over the last few years. And uh, I said, come on, let's go, let's go back to school. I'm like, oh, I was lazy. I was happy at my job. I didn't want to change. But I went back. And with my, it was a th- very rigorous three-year program. And my, my uh, classmates and I all finished. And I graduated with a GPA of 3.98. So and I was a guy who couldn't learn and who I was told I would not be able to succeed academically. And so I've been in practice as a nurse practitioner for seven years. Very happy. I have a great job. I wouldn't have made it without my family. This picture is when I graduated. Um, and, but I struggled so much. Bear with me while I just refresh my memory. Um, so no more school for me. I'm done. And because uh, I'm happy and, I, and I'm, doing, I'm doing well. So just by a raise of hands, how many parents with kids with NF learned that they had NF when their child was born? I see one, I see a few. That's my story. When my daughter was born, she was diagnosed with NF. And that's when I learned I had NF. That was, she's 22 now, and she's amazing. But it made me mad, because when I went back and learned and did research on neurofibromatosis and um, learned all the manifestations, you know, I have those spots. I have axillary freckling. I have neurofibromas that are very evident on my scalp and on my chin. Um, I, have, I have a plexiform neurofibroma on my hand. Why didn't any physician identify this? And it, it made me angry, you know, and, and I was upset. So as all of us, we want to spread awareness. As a nurse practitioner, I've had the privilege of speaking at three conferences for nurse practitioners. And my talk was called Neurofibromatosis, what it is, what it is not, and what to do about it. So I, I taught them the diagnostic criteria. I, ta- I dispelled that, that saying, it's the elef- elef- elephant's mass disease, sorry. And I also taught them who to refer to if they identify a patient in clinic that's got the physical manifestations. So the reward is when they call me and say, hey, Conrad, I had a three-year-old female today in clinic with neurofibromas and calf LA spots, and she had never heard of NF before. I said, what did you do? Oh, I sent her a neuro. Perfect. You can't beat that. So my message to you is if you have dreams, pursue them. And if you fail, so what? That's a lesson. Pick it up and do it again. Evidenced by my journey, there's no doubt that you can succeed if this is something you want to do. Pursue your dreams. That's my story, and I couldn't have done it without my family. So... And Derek Helton is my inspiration to do something physical because he's a beast. And with that, I turn this over to Derek. A great time for the caption is a cutout. That's right. Okay. There we go. There we go. Now we're going. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Thought, yeah, you, go ahead, Carter. I lost, I lost part, so. So anyway, myself, I'm Derek Helton. Um, I was um, actually raised back in Missouri on the farm. Um, so I just want to, before I go into my story, I just want to tell you that I went deaf, completely deaf, about four years ago. So this is the first time I'm speaking in front of people being deaf. So you're, you're actually witnessing no fear, no failure right now. So you might see me lean on humor a little bit, all right? So I guarantee you I'm better at, I guarantee you that I'm better at public speaking than I am Marco Polo, okay? So anyway, so we'll go about my story. I grew up on the farm. 
outside of a village called Tuscumbia, Missouri. My town was a town of 200 people. I lived 10 minutes outside the town on the farm. I knew all the, everyone in high school, first, last name, birthdays, everything. It's just a really small community. So anyway, as I was growing up, when I was really young, I had problems with my left eye. We'd wear an eye patch, and they thought it was, they, they were, when I was young, they couldn't quite see in there to figure out what was going on. They just knew it was a lazy eye. That was all it was, a lazy eye patch, it get it stronger. That was it. So I remember being really young, and they'd make me watch Saturday morning, cor- Saturday morning cartoons with an eye patch over my eye. And I was so mad because I couldn't see it with my bad eye. I would just tear the little part and watch cartoons. Are you wearing your eye patch? Yep, I'm still wearing my eye patch. <laughs> that went on for a while. Also, but it, we didn't trigger anything because all we thought was just a lazy eye. It didn't think in F2 or anything like that. That was even out of the realm of possibility of thought. Went on and then... Um, I think, remember, like, first, third grade, somewhere around there, I failed a hearing test, just one tone. It wasn't anything. But, of course, I'm a farm boy. I had plenty of things I could blame it on. I was around guns, tractors, machinery. Like, maybe I just did something bad, and I, I have a little hearing loss, you know? But then it went on. Once I hit puberty, things changed. I mean, I was strong. I was healthy. I was playing varsity squads. Around my freshman year, I was rocking and rolling sports-wise. But then I started to get weakness in my arm, and we didn't know what it was from. I thought it was another football injury because I did have a neck injury in football where I, they they called it, um, I don't remember what they called it, but it was a a stinger. That's what they called it, a stinger. So I I tackled wrong. I felt shocks all through my body. I remember that. So we thought that was just a football injury. And then I started walking weird. My gait was off. I actually pulled my hip out playing football as well. But I never thought there would be a tumor in my spine causing that. We just thought it was a football injury. So we went on and on and on, and then I went to, I, I was working my way through, you know, I fought through the messed up leg and the messed up arm, I still tried to play, but my, I noticed my sports were really falling, I was like, what's going on, but I didn't really think of it, so I turned to my academic side, I started pursuing more academics, I actually went, my senior year of high school, I went to, um, I got thirst at the local, thirst at um, state, thirst at nationals, and then third at nationals, and the ICF International Science Fair with a science project about Pig poop. So I was doing okay. I changed directions, you know. I, I, I took something that wasn't working, and I found a new direction to go with it. So anyway, I got really good at that. I was really enjoying that. I was set up for college. I really, really die hard to go join the Marine Corps. You know, 9-11 infected me like it affected everybody. I thought, you know, I'm going to join the Marine Corps. I did really well in my ASVAB. I'm going to go in intelligence. I'm going to do something, you know. So that was all on the on my plate. I was ready to do this. I was on 18, ready to take over the world. I graduated high school. I went to join the Marine Corps. I failed military processing with hearing loss. They're like, you only missed a couple of beeps, all right, so go get a medical waiver from your doctor. I'm like, all right, we'll go get a medical waiver so I can join the Marine Corps. Turns out, I went to the doctor. The doctor's like, yeah, something else might be going. Let's just do a quick scan. All right, let's do a quick scan. I've never been in a scan on a farm. Boy, what is a scan? This is the first, first MRI ever, you know? So they're like, then there, we get done. We go over, they're like, Derek, you have tumors on your acoustic nerves. And you've got, acoustic, or you've got a tumor at your C3 in your neck that's actually pancaking your spinal cord. That's probably why you have your arm weakness and your leg's a little messed up. I go, okay, what's this mean? They're like, it's really bad, actually. Like, it's really passing your spinal cord. We need to do surgery right now. This happened two months after I graduated right before I was ready to take on the world. So I went in to have surgery done. They, they cut the one out in my neck. Not really any problems. I lost a little function in my arm, the shoulder a little bit, but nothing bad. But during surgery, another tumor at the T10 line actually swelled up. So whenever you have an injury, your, your, your spinal cord swells up. Some of you guys are doctors, so you know that better than I do. So correct me if I'm wrong. But the way they explained it to me is that it was basically like, it was a straw, and it had a T in it, and the liquid couldn't go through. And then my spinal cord, it just crunched it up. So I had a spinal stroke from T10 down, paralyzing me. The world just flipped over. You know, what do I do now? I walked in thinking I would come out and go back on with my life, and I, but I walked in and then rolled back out. So it was, I, I don't know. I don't even know how you say it. That's just one of those moments where it's like, like you talk about reset. So I sit there, and I was in rehab, in physical rehab, and I remember going, sitting in my room, just hated the world at that point. I'm like, it's done. I'm over, you know? And then they come to me with an F2 diagnosis. They're like, tell me, this is what you have, Derek. I'm like, okay. So I start reading all of it. 
And honestly, this you're 18 and you just got injured like I got injured and you're reading what NF can do, NF2 and NF can do to people, you're scared. And I really got locked in a bad zone. I spent that rehab, my first state in rehab, really, really mad at the world. You know, as you can read it, you get, you get upset about these things. But I got blessed. A couple of other people in the rehab with me were young guns, just like me. One of them, had an, he was like 20 and had an industrial accident, cut half of his body, rolled around on a bed wheel. The other one was a sadder story. They took a, took a gun, a gun injury to his neck, and he couldn't feel anything below his chin. When I met those two guys, my pity party was over. I was like, you know what? I've got a lot of function left. I've got a lot I can still do. And it just it slipped the light switch in me. So then I was at home in Missouri. I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I was on the farm. It was winter time. Winter time in a wheelchair. No go. So I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to figure out some sports to play. There's got to be a sports team around here. I like sports. Let's go back to that, Derek. So I looked it up. I found a wheelchair rugby team. It was in St. Louis. So I'm all right. Can I play wheelchair rugby? They took me up and hooked me up. And they, um, I was driving three hours just to practice for two hours and driving three hours back. So I enjoyed it, you know, I loved it. But I, I realized I couldn't do that. But then I met somebody in Arizona, from Arizona at one of the rugby camps. He's like, hey, why don't you come out to Arizona and play rugby with U of A? I'm like, I was gonna go. I was like, I don't know if I could leave my family, you know? He's like, 360 days of sunshine and pretty girls. I'm like, I'm loading up the vehicle, I'm gone. <laughs> and I was out. I did it all by myself. 18, I was around 18, 19 years old. I packed up my car. I took off on my own. My, my dad helped me drive out there. He took an airplane back. I just said, I'm going to start over right now. I'm going to start over. And I started playing rugby. It turned out I was actually pretty good at it. You know, I was clever. I wasn't smart. I wasn't the greatest athlete, but I questioned myself. I questioned everything, and I was clever. I, made, I found tricks that other people couldn't find. I was, NF2 had made me super adaptable to situations. So I do that, and then... Within the first year, I'd already got caught the eye of the then USA coach. The USA coach invited me uh, to the training camp in 2007, and I started playing with the big guys. And then they just, they just ate me alive, and it made me so mad because they were so much better than me. But that was, I was scared I wouldn't be there, be good enough to play. But this fear and failure thing came in. I just, I'd seen it in my past. I knew fear is just. Uh, failure is just a fear in itself. I, I can control that. I control that situation. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to find the best guy here, and I'm going to shadow him, and I'm going to keep working until I can beat him. And when I can beat him, then I'll find the next, next better player, and I will beat him. And I just, I had to control the situation. So then it came to it, 2008, Paralympics came up, and I turned out to be the first alternate for that team. I was just one away from being on the team that got to go. I was, that was really one of my points. Like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to miss this opportunity again. And I, I, I was talking to Conrad about it. I felt some guilt. I recognized, you know, when I train, I work through every situation. I, all the losses, all the wins. I mentally imagine every scenario from winning, winning, win, winning, to losing, losing, losing. And I have all that planned out. So the deal was when I... Whenever I got, when I got to 2008, the guilt for me not training. I, maybe I didn't train hard enough. I really, I really questioned myself. Did I train really hard enough? And my answer was no. I didn't train hard enough. I did train hard, but I need a little more. So 2009 came up. I was, I mean, in the gym every day. I was switching my chair 20 miles a day. I was doing 50-mile bike rides on my hand cycle. I just I had to change my rhythm. I, I, I couldn't let that fear of failure happen again. I couldn't live in that guilt of not pushing myself to my highest ability with what I've got. I can't let what I've got hold me back. I've got to get, I've got to get done what I can get done with what I have. And that, that was all, all up from there, you know. what? 2009, I made the team. We won Argentina Gold International Tournament. Then 2000, uh, 2010, was Canada. We won in Canada for a gold. Oh, yeah, that was World Champions gold. In 2011, we won in Bogota gold. Uh, 2012, we won bronze, which was another sad moment. I've got my bronze medal laying around somewhere. If someone see it later. But anyway, that was another sad moment. 
But that's what it is. That's the ebb and flow of life. I didn't take that. It wasn't so much a failure. It was a learning point, you know. You have to take that learning point. You have to take that failure and turn it into a learning point. Then, then you're prepared for the next time that comes. You just have to cycle through it. So then I went uh, 2013 and 14. I had a couple more international tournaments. Oh, golds again. We're back on top. But then 2015 came, and that was the year of me that I got struck with another round of NF2. NF2 hit in 2015 with a brain tumor started to cause seizures. And my hearing started to decrease a whole lot. I don't know what triggered the growth, but something triggered it. And I ended up having a brain surgery there, which fixed the seizures. But awesome, because those are the scariest things I've ever been through in my life. But because I was now, because I had brain surgery and my hearing loss, my brain had changed, and I couldn't play rugby on the level I wanted to play. I tried, but I'd go out on the court. I just didn't have the same connection physically and mentally with my body. So I had to figure out another out. I had to figure out, I had to re, redo my life again and relearn how to adapt to a new, new love, find my new passion. And, you know, my wife, she's back here somewhere. I can't see her, it's all bright. But she's really held me up on the pedestal, you know, between my wife and my faith and my family. It's just a new level. Now I really do enjoy being a stay-at-home dad. I mean, it's fun. I, I get on Twitter sometimes. I try to be a philosopher, you know. I don't really care what I do right now because I can't fail at it. I've, I've processed myself where I, I, I don't see failure. It's just a point of start. If, there's a, if it's somebody else can do the failure, that's just a starting point for something new. So I just kind of roll with bounces. I think that adaptability is one thing that really pushes all of us with NF. NF1, NF2, whatever you have. I never, I've never seen more creative people in my life, you know. That's, that's just how I feel about it. I mean, we, the, everyone with NF adapts, overcomes, they find the challenges, and they just, you know. I was telling Conrad, I think it's just, it's conditioned. We're conditioned. Everything is practice. Practice is those, those scenarios. Find those, find those hurdles and find a way around them. And that, that's, that's been my story in my life. Conrad, right. you want to share any more? That's kind of my story. Love your story. <laughs> do you want to? Do you want to talk about the pictures here? Oh yeah. So anyway, these are the pictures. This one, first one, the picture um, where I actually look really nice. <laughs> that one's uh, 2012. They're doing a photo shoot at uh, 2012 Paralympics in London. The middle picture is actually the first time we got to play an outdoor in Sydney, Australia. We were, that's the gold medal ceremony where we got another gold. And the last one is actually a live action shot of me playing in London. We got to play in front of Prince Harry and like 20,000 people. And oddly enough, I'm more nervous now than I was there. Me too. So as Derek mentioned, Krista, my wife Maggie, my daughter Marisol and Caleb are here, both have NF, and, and thank God they're healthy. Uh, they've had learning challenges that, they're, that they've overcome as well. Um, but I think with the support of our families, our spouses, and our children, we've been able to succeed. I've succeeded because when I was in grad school, I just, it was so stressful, I wanted to quit so many times, when I was like, just go through it, just keep going, just keep going, and I succeeded. I felt when I graduated with my degree, it was her degree too, because she worked so hard. My clothes was ironed, my dinner was cooked, so all I had to do was focus on school, work, school, work, school, work, and she took care of the household, and so it was her degree. And the funny thing, if I can take back, when I graduated with my associate's degree, I told you I had taken so many classes so many times, um, when I graduated and got my associate degree in nursing back in the 90s, they gave me a second degree. They said, you don't know, you have a degree in general studies too. So like I graduated with a second degree with unintended because I had taken so many classes. I had tried so many times. Um, but without our family, we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have succeeded. Derek wouldn't have, I wouldn't have. Um, the things we want to stress to you is instill, instill confidence in your children. When I tried going to college on my own, initially, when I first tried, I just didn't have the self-confidence. I didn't have the discipline. I didn't know how to learn. I think after I learned that I had NF is when my story made sense. My life made sense. Okay, now I know why I'm shorter than my brother and sister. 
Now I know why I wasn't a superstar rugby player. Now I know why. <laughs> now, or why I was just what I was clumsy and I wasn't great at sports. Now I know why I failed in school. But as an adult learner, I learned how to overcome those challenges. So instill that confidence. They can do your children, your young adults, any of us can do anything you really try. Again, failure is is just a lesson. Never quit. That's the only failure. And I, I said this before, surround yourself with people who are doing what you want to do. If you want to go to nursing school, befriend nurses and hang out with them. If you want to go to college, befriend a bunch of college kids, the right ones, careful. <laughs> because that stuff is infectious. It is infectious. If you're hanging out with people who are doing great things, not only will it inspire you, but some of that is literally infectious and you will get that drive or they will get that drive to pursue bigger dreams. Anything you want to say? No, I agree. I mean, like you said, there's parallels between sports and education. I mean, to me, it's all about practice, practice, study, study, practice, study. If you get those things done, you can put those scenarios in your head, you find a way to overcome them, and you'll be prepared for failure, prepared to act on that failure. Like you, learning how to learn again. Like me, learning how to do this move with now a limited, a limited function, you know. You just, you've got to condition yourself and train yourself mentally for those situations. Good. Thank you.